keynote speaker is Professor Krishna Reddy, another good friend of uh, ours. And uh, hi, Krishna. Hi, hi, Gopal. How are you? Uh, we're running slight short on time, so I will do a quick introduction. And uh, I'm sure people want to listen to your excellent work in geoenvironmental engineering, as always. More than me bittering about you. Um, let me do a quick, quick introduction, and then I'll pass on the uh, baton to you. So, what's a huge, uh, uh, I can talk, uh, talk about you for a long, long time, but let me do a quick introduction. Uh, Krishna Reddy is a university scholar, distinguished researcher and professor of civil engineering, civil and environmental engineering, director of sustainable engineering research lab, and director of the geotechnical and geoenvironmental engineering laboratory at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Dr. Reddy received PhD in civil engineering at Illinois Institute of Technology, Chicago. Uh, he received gold medal for his BE uh, from Osmania University, Hyderabad, uh, ME civil engineering from IIT Rurki, Prior to joining the University of Illinois, Dr. Reddy worked as a civil engineer and project manager for uh, over three years in the industry. Um, Dr. Reddy is a registered professional civil engineer and an uh, Envision uh, sustainability professional. Uh, Reddy's teaching uh, and research and consulting experience includes uh, many, many different areas. Jo technical investigation in infrastructure, environmental pollution control and remediation technologies, waste management and beneficial reuse, sustainable resilient engineering. I think uh, everybody would agree with me that Dr. Reddy is uh, extremely well known for his geo-environmental engineering work. He's published over 259 journal papers, more than 200 conference papers, 22 <coughs> book chapters and over uh, has over 14,000 citations. Uh, he received many awards, including the ACA Wesley Honor Award, ASTM uh, Hogan Tugler Award, UIC Distinguished Research Award from University of Illinois Scholar Award, and University of Illinois Award for Excellence in Teaching. He's a fellow of American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, Diplomat of uh, civil uh, of geotechnical engineering and board certified environmental engineer. I can, as I said, I can go on for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. I'll stop there and give the floor to you, Krishna. Please. Okay. Hey, thanks a lot, Gopal, for uh, that nice introduction. Uh, nice to see you uh, online. Um, so uh, I also miss uh, seeing all of our uh, friends. Um, you know, IGC has always been my uh, meeting place uh, to see everyone. Um, and uh, anyway, you know, it's, uh, you know, virtually it's better than nothing, but um, hopefully uh, when we'll get back to normal uh, in the near future. So, uh, Gopal, can you see my um, yeah, yeah. presentation? Yeah, you're good, Krishna. We can see you. Okay. okay. So, uh, as Dr. Madhubushi mentioned, you know, I work in uh, geo-environmental engineering area, so I chose a topic, uh, I don't know, you know, many people may not be familiar with. Um, um, so, there are a lot of challenges in uh, geo-environmental engineering. Uh, so, I'm going to talk about this electro-bioremediation. Uh, this is a technology to remediate contaminated uh, sites, uh, soils, and groundwater. Um, so before I get, get into my presentation, you know, I, I want to mention what kind of research that I do, um, because you've probably seen me, seen my name in a lot of different places. Um, so a lot of my research is on environmental remediation of soils, sediments, groundwater, and stormwater. And I also work on waste management and landfill engineering. And uh, uh, for the last uh, seven, eight years, I've been working on uh, life cycle assessment and sustainable and resilient engineering. And uh, of course, uh, you know, many of you know that uh, my master's and PhD are on geotechnical engineering. So I am familiar with all the, all the topics in uh, geotechnical engineering. I also worked as a, a geotechnical engineer, a civil engineer for three years before uh, joining the university. Of course, my background is civil engineering. 
So the, the first two that you see they are uh, geo-environmental engineering, and the third one you see is a sustainable engineering. So my focus has been on uh, geo-environmental engineering and sustainable engineering. Um, you know, there are a lot of challenges in, in geo-environmental engineering and sustainable engineering fields. So uh, anything that you, you do in these fields have a really a, a huge immediate impact on practice. So that is uh, very much satisfying to me working in this field. So before I get started, I want to, you know, also thank uh, Professor uh, Kiamut Kumaran and also the conference organizing committee for this invitation. And, um, you know, I also want to thank uh, my co-author and collaborator, Professor Claudio Camusier uh, from University of Vigo, Spain. Uh, we actually wrote a paper together that is going to be published in uh, Indian Geotechnical Journal. So uh, if you are uh, looking for more details, you know, many details will be in the paper that is upcoming. I want to thank my graduate students and, uh, of course, the funding from uh, U.S. National Science Foundation. So uh, I know, you know, many of you are not familiar with the geo-environmental engineering, so I will give you a brief introduction to, uh, you know, problem of contaminated sites, uh, risk-based site remediation, that's what we do now, and what are the different remediation technologies that we have. And I'm going to focus on this bioremediation because, because this is, uh, you know, very simple and uh, sustainable technology. I will mention briefly what it is, but it has some limitations. So how do we overcome those limitations? So, so that's where this electro-bioremediation comes in. I'm going to explain that one, uh, you know, very briefly. And this is kind of, you know, still a lot of research is going on on this topic. Uh, so I will give you the state of uh, uh, the situation on, on this technology. And then at the end, closing a remark. So the problem of contaminated sites, you know, is there everywhere in the world you know in some places you know you know exactly how many sites are there some places they didn't even start you know investigating this this issue so um and it but it is a worldwide problem uh, regarding this contaminated soils and groundwater and what are the sources of uh, soil and groundwater contamination there could be many sources i mean if you, even if you think about air pollution right uh, from air pollution, you know, you're going to have particulate matter and that particulate matter is going to come on the, you know, fall on the, on, on the ground and uh, it mixes up with the soil and soil gets contaminated with the infiltration of precipitation, you can get uh, groundwater contaminated. You know, there are a lot of other sources of contamination, um, but if you ask me, you know, one major source that would be the land disposal of solid and liquid waste. And of course, you know, in the U.S. we have uh, waste containment systems but in many countries you know you don't have those you have dump sites so, so a lot of things will uh, leach into the soil and groundwater and pose uh, problems why do we need to worry about this soil and groundwater contamination that's going to basically cause a lot of uh, uh, health issues into you in humans um, you know all the diseases that you see you know um, uh, some of them are not explained by uh, doctors you know a lot of them are attributed to the environmental factors and also, you know, you are going to damage the ecology, you know, the plants, birds, you know, uh, all, all those, uh, you know, surrounding environment is going to be damaged. So this is definitely not acceptable. So, you know, we need to uh, um, prevent uh, soil and groundwater pollution. But if there is some pollution, we need to clean up the pollution. What do you mean by pollution? Pollution is basically these toxic chemicals that you are dealing with. There could be many different types, inorganic chemicals, organic chemicals, and, you know, and all of them are causing um, adverse effects on humans and, and uh, in the environment. So in the U.S., we have a strict rules. You know, we have to uh, clean up a contaminated site, you know, if it is found. Uh, first thing, what you do is a site characterization. Um, you know, this is where you can employ all the geotechnical investigation tools, but uh, you know, additional tools to characterize the, uh, the chemical concentrations. Uh, then you have to do the risk assessment, um, you know, health risk assessment. Uh, this is not familiar to geotechnical engineers, but, uh, you know, this is an essential step, uh, you know, that you need to learn, um, you know, if you want to uh, uh, work in this field. And then if the risk is more than acceptable, then you need to define the remedial goals and then look at, uh, you know, what kind of technologies are out there to uh, use to reduce the risk. Um, and the site contamination could vary from site to site. You know, you may have, for example, a dump site where, uh, you know, uh, you need to put a containment systems. 
Um, and, uh, you know, you may have a uh, soil contamination uh, in the weather zone uh, that needs different type of technologies uh, for groundwater, uh, you know, in the source zone that needs a different technologies. And if you have a dilute plume, then that needs a different technology. Uh, you know, that's why we have developed a lot of different types of technologies, containment technologies and treatment technologies. Um, you know, I teach a you know, graduate level course on these uh, different technologies. Um, you know, if you want to treat the soils in situ, there are soil, in -situ soil remediation technologies. If you want to excavate and treat it, you have the, the ex situ uh, remediation technologies. And then you have a groundwater remediation technologies that uh, you have to use based on the site conditions, based on the contamination conditions. So there's no one single technology that can solve all the problems. You have to choose the technology based on the site conditions. So if you are interested in learning more uh, basics about remediation technologies, I suggest you to look at this book. Um, now let's talk about this bioremediation. The bioremediation is a you know kind of a you know nature-based solution because you know in uh, soils and groundwater you have a lot of microbes already existing. So we are trying to use them for remediation. Uh, and if you have the right microbes, they can actually you know use the organic contaminants as a food uh, as a food and then you know convert into basically uh, you know uh, safe uh, end products that's what I'm showing you by schematically here if you have a contamination such as oils and other things and you know the microorganisms uh, mediate it mediate uh, to convert them into uh, you know environmentally friendly byproducts again. So uh, if, if in, in terms of the, the chemistry and biology, you know, basically this process is called the oxidation reduction reaction. Um, and, you know, in these kind of reactions, one chemical or, you know, loses all electron and other gains the electron. So a lot of times organic compounds are, uh, you know, losing electrons. So therefore you need to have an electron acceptor, you know, to take that uh, electron. So electron acceptor is an is a essential thing. So uh, if you have oxygen present, uh, then oxygen can uh, serve as electron acceptor. So then that whole process is called the uh, aerobic biodegradation. If you don't have oxygen, let's say if you go in deep into the ground, you know, you don't have oxygen. In that case, you need to have a different uh, electron acceptor. So there are different organic chemicals, inorganic anions that can serve as electron, uh, alternate electron acceptor. So you need to have, uh, you know, electron acceptor for uh, you know biodegradation of the contamination to occur and this technology is nice because you can uh, degrade all kinds of organic compounds you know it could be petroleum hydrocarbons or more uh, you know uh, complex uh, organic compounds you can also apply to treat the metals but you cannot really you know destroy or uh, disappear metals you know you can only you know convert you know mobile uh, metals into immobile metals so that's kind of uh, uh, you know, bioimmobilization, they call it, uh, if you are applying to metals. But organics, you are basically degrading them to, you know, uh, uh, non, uh, um, you know, say, we need to save for byproducts. Also, also, it sounds simple, but, you know, there are a lot of things have to be right in order for this degradation to occur. So, first of all, you need to have a right microbes, and then the contaminants should be available for the microbes. For example, they want to, you know, use it so contamination if it is not available then you know they cannot use it um you know and uh, you need to think about what is the contaminant structure and what is the toxicity of the contaminant to the the microbes and as i mentioned we need to have electron acceptors and they these are you know uh, microbes need the nutrients uh, to to survive and also these microbes are very picky you know they need to have right moisture content right temperature right ph right salinity and they don't want to have any other type of uh, highly toxic uh, you know materials including the heavy metals around them uh, and so you need to have a right conditions for the microbes to degrade this um, organic contamination so if you don't have the right uh, situation we can that's where the engineered bioremediation comes in you know? um, so if you don't have any nutrients or electron acceptors you provide those things uh, uh, to engineered systems. So that's called biostimulation. And sometimes you don't have microbes, right microbes in the site, at the site, 
then you can supply the micro, uh, micro that's called the uh, bio augmentation. So you can actually implement this one in the field very uh, eff effectively. You know, uh, you have a soil that is contaminated, microbes are already there. Maybe you just need to provide some oxygen or some nutrients, uh, and you know this remediation will occur uh, easily. So it's it's a very simple. If you have a groundwater, again, um, you may you will have uh, microorganisms, but you may not have right environmental conditions, maybe nutrients. So you just uh, you know use uh, uh, wells uh, to introduce these nutrients and disperse uh, them through the contaminated media. So you are making those available to the microbes and, you know, the, the remediation will occur. And as I mentioned, you know, there are many advantages with bioremediation uh, because organic contaminants are completely, you know, converted into non-toxic byproducts. So you don't have any issue going into the future. Minimum uh, mechanical equipment is needed and it can be done in situ as well as ex situ. It's, uh, you know, the low cost technology. And uh, if you analyze in, in more detail, this is the green, sustainable, and resilient technologies, low energy, low emissions, less waste, conserve natural resources, and so forth. However, there are some disadvantages. One thing is, depending upon the conditions, they, it may take longer time to degrade. The other thing is, some compounds, they don't convert directly into you know, uh, non-toxic products, so it has to go into a certain uh, sequence. Uh, and if you have a partial degradation, and uh, at the end of the partial degradation, if you have some byproducts, those byproducts could be more toxic than the, uh, the contaminants that you started with. So you need to be careful, make sure that, you know, you, you don't have a partial degradation of uh, uh, contaminants. You, you have a complete, uh, you know, degradation of the contaminants. So that's, uh, you know, the, one of the challenges. And uh, you don't want to have very high concentrations because these uh, microbes don't like uh, that high concentrations. And I, I mentioned that limited bioavailability because contamination has to be, you know, in, in soluble form or easily, you know, desorbable form. Um, you know, that's a, a one requirement. And you need to have a nutrients um, and right environmental conditions, and you need to have a right microbes. And also, you know, one of the challenges with these technologies, if you have a sandy type soils, it's easy to hydraulically, you know, introduce these things. But if you have, a, you know, clay type soils or heterogeneous soils, then hydraulic methods don't work. So that's the, the biggest concern in terms of the field applications when you have, uh, you know, low permeable soils. So in these situations, you know, um, bioremediation has, uh, you know, uh, challenges. So it won't work uh, the way you want it. So in order to address these limitations, uh, we can combine the bioremediation with electrokinetics. Um, and then what is, uh, you know, then this technology is known as electrobioremediation. I worked on, you know, a lot of research projects dealing with electrokinetics, you know, using it as an individual technology to remediate soils and groundwater, but I'm not talking about that one. There are some issues with that technologies, but here I'm talking about using the electrokinetics to address the limitations of bioremediation. So what, what, what are we doing? Basically, you know, you have the wells already and you are trying to introduce the nutrients, but uh, in, um, you know, combining electrokinetics, basically you are putting the electrodes into these wells and applying a small, uh, you know, electric potential. And that's all, you know, that's the additional thing that you are doing it. Um, and, you know, when you do that one, uh, bioremediation is going to occur um, more efficiently. That's good. And electrokinetics can also offer other benefits, you know, make the contamination bioavailable, uh, make the bacteria mobile a little bit, you know, in, in the soil so that uh, contamination remediation can occur throughout the media. And uh, you can have uh, electron acceptors and nutrients migrated, you know, you can put it in the electrode wells under electric potential, they can be transported into the contamination media. And also, you know, electrochemically, you can produce these electron donors, uh, hydrogen and oxygen also in case if you need them. And then if you have uh, metals, in addition to organics, that is the case at many sites, this can be also, you know, remove those contaminants. So, uh, you know, basically when you put an electrode and apply electric potential, you're inducing this different electrokinetic transport processes. So there's electromigration, basically the ions moving you know, uh, to the opposite electrodes. Um, 
and then there's the bulk movement of uh, water, uh, you know, due to, due to this uh, electric double layer effect it's called electroosmosis, uh, and the electrophoresis, uh, you know, the, the charge coolies, my cells and uh, bacterial cells, they can also move. So basically, you are getting the advantage of these processes when you introduce the electrodes and apply very small amount of electric potential. And in addition to those uh, transport processes, you're going to see these electrolysis reactions happening at the electrodes. At the anode, you're going to generate the oxygen, and at the uh, cathode, you're going to generate the uh, uh, hydrogen. But you also generate this H plus and OH minus ions, and they go to electromigrate into the soil. That's going to change the pH of the soil. So you need to make sure that the pH of the soil is changed in a favorable manner rather than in adverse manner. So you, that's a one thing you need to keep an eye on it. And as I mentioned, this uh, hydrogen and oxygen can be used as uh, uh, electron acceptors. So electro uh, electrobioremediation basically is the combination of the bioremediation and electrokinetics can overcome you know, all the major limitations of bioremediation. It can degrade the organics. It can be applied to any, any soil. So now, you know, low permeable soils is not an issue because you can generate the electroosmosis through those soils. So, you know, which otherwise would not have been possible by hydraulic methods, which is good. And then, you know, if you have a heavy metals or mixed contaminants, those can be addressed. And we are not talking about making the bioremediation more complicated. It's a very simple additional equipment that you need. So overall, it's going to be cost effective. Overall, it's going to be green and sustainable and resilient. So a lot of investigations have uh, taken place to look at you know, how do, what processes work under this electrobioremediation and what are the system variables that we need to control. So I'm showing you, you know, different uh, types of uh, uh, laboratory uh, electrokinetic, electrobioremediation, uh, uh, you know, reactors that have been used by uh, different researchers here. Uh, one of the questions, first questions comes when you talk about electrobioremediation uh, is, when you apply electric potential, when you apply electricity, Will the microbes die, right? And so, will they get shocking effect? Uh, the some the studies that uh, have been done is shows here. If you have hundred, uh, you know, milliamps or the, you know, three hundred milliamps, uh, you can see that you know this is the, the count, you know, microbial count uh, after treatment, uh, you know, uh, compared to the before treatment. So, if you have hundred uh, uh, milliamps of uh, current. Um, you know, there's no issue. So you only apply electric potential for two hours, they, you have a 97. So there's a 3% reduction. And the four hours, there is a, uh, you know, 10% uh, 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 reduction. So yeah, that's that's taken. And 300 milliamps also, there is not much change. But if you have more, you know, in this case, you know, it's found to be 350 milliamps is the threshold. And you can see that, uh, you know, microbes uh, die as a result of this, uh, uh, electric shock. So you really need to think about, you know, um, what is the range of uh, range for applying this electricity. Uh, 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 you don't want to apply too much to kill kill the microbes. So that's one thing that you need to keep in mind. So you work within that, uh, you know, electricity range that uh, is not uh, harmful to the microbes. And then, you know, so when you apply electric potential, you're going to see, you know, these contaminations getting degraded. So, for example, in this one, uh, this is just in the water. You know, you can put a, you know, uh, diameter solution in the water and apply electric potential. So you see, you know, there is a reduction of this PCEs contamination that you can see without electrolysis, without, uh, you know, ele 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 electric potential, you can see that it's not going to happen. And also, you know, the biodegradation, you know, if you, uh, you, you can see, you know, if you have a microbes and apply electric potential, there's going to be a substantial reduction in the concentration versus, you know, if you sterilize, basically kill all the microbes and apply electric potential, you're not going to see that effect. So the point is, you know, uh, microbes are doing better under applied electric potential. And applied electric potential can facilitate transport of uh, nutrients that are needed for microbes. So this, this study shows that sulfates, nitrates, ammonium can be easily transported under electric potential. But when it comes to the soil, you know, again, uh, there are some experiments that are done uh, that show that, um, uh, you know, lactate is one of the, uh, the electron donors that 
um, that can be transported into the soil. They, they did these experiments with the clay and sand. Even with clay, you know, you can see that uh, lactate could be uh, could be transported into, into the soil uh, quite well. Um, and then the oxygen that is generated at the electrode that can be also transported under electric potential. Uh, that's a you know positive uh, news about it. Uh, again, you know, uh, lactate getting transported into the soil that will basically you know enhances the biodegradation in 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 the, in the in the soil. So as you see, you know, as the lactate goes inside, and then you know you have a microbes, and then this PCE is one of the toxic contaminants that is found at a lot of contaminated sites, and that you know eventually you know gets disappeared. And you know, here is the study again, another study that looked at lactate transport into the soil uh, by uh, electric potential that could be achieved. And as a result of that, you can see the microbial population has increased. So after 47 days of electric potential application is this much. Uh, and then if the second bar that you see is after 56 days, so it's increased. Even after shutting down electric potential, then you can see that, uh, you know, still that uh, biological activity keeps on happening. And as a result of that, you can see, you know, the uh, contaminant concentrations and the degradation pathways. Basically, you start up with the PCE and it gets degraded into these different compounds. At the end, you end up with the methane, which is uh, non-toxic. There are a lot of studies that look at this electromigration, electrobioremediation. Uh, this is another contaminant, basically total petroleum hydrocarbon. So here, you know, if you don't have it, any treatment, contaminant concentration is not going anywhere, just the bioremediation, and then you can see EK and EK and bio, that's electrobioremediation can really, you know, give very positive. Results. To, uh, you need to look at, uh, you know, how uh, bi microbial, uh, you know, uh, microbes are changing. That, that can be done these days very easily with microbial analysis and, and um, you know, you, you can get these results. And again, you know, just uh, showing you there is an overwhelming, um, you know, uh, amount of data uh, uh, that shows that electro uh, bioremediation can work for different types of contaminants. Um, and, you know, just looking into more fundamentals, you can also look at uh, this, this uh, you know, there is a shift in types of microbes that will survive under um, or, uh, you know, uh, enrich under uh, electric potential compared to, you know, other ones. So again, the other, other thing that uh, I found very interesting in one of the studies is, do you have to apply electric potential continuously? So what happens if I, you know, go with bio and apply electric potential only for some time and then stop it and let my, uh, you know, uh, bioremediation take place. Um, and then, you know, just a sequential bioremediation and uh, electrokinetics. That is also found to be very, very effective. So instead of, uh, you know, uh, applying um, current, uh, you know, continuously, you can apply for a certain amount of time and then uh, take off for just the bioremediation to, to occur. And, you know, not only like a small scale lab testing, some researchers have also done it at a pilot scale, you know, uh, in the field, but in a, in a small scale. And, uh, you know, this is one study that uh, looked at um, this electrobioremediation of pHs in the, in the field. Again, the results really overwhelmingly show that um, uh, com combining uh, electrokinetics and bioremediation can really, you know, uh, make the process uh, effective and also efficient. Um, and, you know, again, the microbial, you know, population is going to increase under this, uh, you know, electric stimulation. So there are very limited studies in terms of the full scale actual applications. So there's one that is done in the U.S. Um, so this is, this is a site, uh, um, uh, you know, Air Force site um, uh, in uh, Florida, U.S. And uh, here there was a contamination, there was a spill that happened, and the top soils are all sandy type soils. And basically this, uh, this contamination is PCE, this uh, denser than water, density is denser than water, so it basically sinks in. 
it uh, went to is sunk through the, the the sandy soils and then it entered into the clay and it got stuck in the clay and and this is becoming a source of a continuous source of contamination to underlying groundwater so how do you clean up this of course this is the clay so you cannot use any wells and then use hydraulic methods to clean up so this electro uh, bioremediation method you know is uh, investigated at this site so they used uh, you know several wells um as um um you know uh put, put the electrodes and some other wells to supply the nutrients and they were able to supply you know the needed nutrients or electron donors uh, very efficiently uh they even you know try to um, you know apply some microbes also so they were able to find uh, good results based on this uh, large scale uh, field experiments so this is the, you know, if you look at this sketch, you know, this, this uh, uh, monitoring well nine is very outside of uh, gradient, you know, all the treatment is happening in this uh, box here. Uh, so uh, if you look at the results of that up gradient where it's beyond the, the treatment zone, you have this contamination PCE um, present, nothing is happening there. But if you look at the monitoring well within the treatment area, you can see this PCE is the, is the major contaminant that is there. And that is, you know, degraded into these byproducts. At the end, you want to get everything into ethane. So again, that that uh, shows that uh, you know if there's an effective treatment that's happening, and that is not at one location. It's also true at other location. Also, this there's a microbial uh, uh, characterization is also shown here, and uh, that also shows that you know this works uh, really really well. And even the soil sampling is done, and that also shows that concentrations, PCE concentrations decrease and get into, um, um, you know, um, non-toxic products or other products. Again, there's a microbial characterization is done, and uh, you can understand a lot about, you know, what is happening to the microbes, you know, which microbes are doing the job. So you don't have to rely just on the contaminant concentrations, but you can, uh, you know, look at this microbial characterization and uh, you know, uh, find out uh, which microbes are doing the job, which microbes are being enriched under electric potential. So uh, overall, this project, field project, is shown to be uh, you know uh, very successful. So uh, just to conclude, you know, uh, the takeaway points from this uh, presentation is you know the bioremediation and electroplanetary remediation can be used individually, but combining them it can be very you know effective. And, and cheaper uh, and sustainable and resilient. And this can be applied to any, any contaminated uh, soil conditions, any contaminated conditions. So this is kind of a very versatile. And it's, the system is very flexible. It's not like a one black box that you have to use, you know, uh, anywhere you want it, but like, you know, you can tailor it. Um, and, you know, the equipment that you need is, uh, you know, not, uh, you know, a special. And however, you know, we need to have a more detailed performance monitoring uh, stuff to look at it. Um, if you want to know more details about this electrochemical uh, remediation technologies, I recommend you to look at this uh, this book uh, that, uh, that we wrote and uh, for other remediation projects, you can look at these books. I know I, I have taken out, uh, you know, a bit more time, so um, I, I may not have enough time for answering all the questions, so feel free to you know, contact me uh, through email and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you very much for your um, patience and listening to me. Thanks, sir. Uh. Oh, <clears throat> thank you, <clears throat> Krishna, for uh, an excellent presentation. I, I just realized this, it must be really early for you. Uh, thanks for waking up early in the morning and doing a fantastic lecture for us.